Happy Easter and welcome to Wooddale Church. If we've not met before, my name is Kyle and I'm here with Lynn, who's our pastor of groups and connections here at Wooddale. And we want to welcome you to this Easter celebration. Lynn, it's exciting. It's, it's Easter. It's so exciting. Kyle, this is such a big deal. We get to gather and we get to celebrate our risen King Jesus. Did your family do anything special for Easter when you were a kid? Yeah. You know, my mom made this Easter bunny cake. It was a cake like in the shape of an Easter. She put coconut all over it and I hate coconut. And so she would always leave one little ear without coconut shavings just just for me. It was kind of a nice little thing. How about you guys? So sweet that she remembered that. My dad used to hide Easter eggs for us, which was super easy when we were little, super fun. But as we got older, he had to hide them in harder places and he had to start like making notes so he wouldn't forget where he had uh, hidden the eggs. Because of, of the real eggs, the hard yeah, boy. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The smell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we, we, we're, regardless of whatever events and celebrations you're used to, what we have an opportunity to lean into right now is worshiping God. Uh, we get to join with uh, generations of believers who have come before us to worship Jesus, who rose from the grave. And that changed everything, Lynn. And so we have a unique celebration and way to do that in this service. We do. We have the opportunity to worship with our worship leaders from all of our campuses, which is such a unique opportunity. And then we're going to hear a message from our senior pastor, Dale, and he's going to give you the opportunity to respond to that message. And all of you are going to have an opportunity to decide what that means for you and for your heart and how we can celebrate that together. Yeah, looking forward for all of us to have that opportunity to respond. We're also, Lynn, looking forward to next week because right. there's exciting things happening here at Wooddale Church. So what's coming up next weekend? Next weekend, we get to bounce back. Our children's ministry kids that are fourth grade and younger get to come back and there's going to be bouncy houses and they get the opportunity to learn about how to bounce back in life and how God shows up with us when we need to bounce back and, and move forward with things that are hard. Yeah, we're excited for what is going to be happening in those kids' ministries. We're also excited across the church. We're celebrating what God is going to be doing in and through the next vision here at Wooddale Church. It's something we call Legacy of Hope. And our congregation has been gathering together. We've been praying. We've been planning. We've been making commitments. And we're going to announce where we're at in terms of legacy of hope and what is next with that vision, you're not going to want to miss next weekend. So thanks for joining with us. We ask you to settle in, prepare your heart as we now come together, wherever you are in the world, to worship God this Easter. In the end, the proof is 
bright crimson robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a casket the children are singing and dancing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in bloom pushed up from the embers rivers of tears flow from good times are singing and dancing loud. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound. And the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that we love are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. something to be grateful for, to sing and celebrate. Thank God that the stone was rolled away, right? Because we wouldn't have an Easter morning if that wasn't true. But if I'm honest, as I catch my breath, <laughs> if I'm honest, there have been Easter mornings, not unlike this one, that sometimes I've struggled to figure out like, yes, God, I am excited for that homecoming when I can see you in heaven because I trust your son, Jesus. But man, a couple thousand years ago, this event that happened, what does that have to do with my hope today? And uh, because up till Jesus, before Jesus even, for hundreds and thousands of years, there was a special group of people called the Israelites that followed God, that were faithful to God. Problem is they, they had to do it through a different covenant, it's called. They had a different system. They had hundreds and hundreds of rules and laws that they had to strictly abide to, some of which meant bringing animals and sacrificing them in the temple to make payment for their sins, because they too <laughs> had a bunch of stuff that got in the way of their relationship with God, but then enter Jesus on the scene. And I tell you what, friends, what he did in that moment didn't just change history for those folks a couple thousand years ago. And it doesn't just change our eternity in heaven. Though those things are true, it changes our today. And I'll tell you why. Because in the book of Hebrews, <laughs> there's this beautiful passage. And I really love how this author named Eugene Peterson uh, words it in his paraphrase. He just took scripture and kind of like put different kind of language to it, still true to the meaning, but stuff just jumps out a little bit different. I want you to hear this. It says, every priest goes to work at the altar each day, those priests of old. Those priests offer the same old sacrifices year in, year out, and it never makes a dent in the sin problem. But as a priest, Christ, our high priest, made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it, he says. Then he sat down right beside God and waited for his enemies to cave in. I love that. But check out this phrase. If there's one thing you hear, this is it, ready? It says, it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. And by that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part 
in the purifying process. Folks, if there is one sentence <laughs> that I could give you, that I could remind my own spirit and heart of what the gospel is, the good news, that is it. There's a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person, that Jesus, <laughs> that perfects us as imperfect people. And that's not just a what was, not just a what will be, that is a what is, because what Jesus has done. And whether you've known that for a really long time, or maybe God's just starting to nudge you towards that truth, whatever it is, boy, that is what brings us hope on this Easter Sunday on this day, on this year, because the Jesus that crushed death, <laughs> cracked that uh, stone open wide and offers us that same life, offers it to you today, right here, right now. So this next song is all about what he has done for you and me. Let's give him all we got with our worship. See, see on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, and my Jesus set me free. You too. Look at the wounds and give me life, grace flowing from His side, and no greater sacrifice, the one and only of what He's done. What he's done, and all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, it's true. My future is heaven, and I praise God for what he's done. Future is 
hallelujah lord we love you lord we magnify your name lord we glorify your name and we lift you up and we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory we'll never forget what you've done for us how you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins and for that we are forgiven and God we worship you and we magnify you Lord be with us and bless the message as we go forward in your service Lord we love you we praise you and we give you all the glory and help us not to ever forget the wonderful thing that you've done for us and all God's people said amen Well, happy Resurrection Sunday to all of you who are joining us online or at one of our venues or our campuses. This is the ultimate of celebrations. But I have a strange question I want to ask you. How would you feel if somebody walked up to you and said that they knew everything about you? I mean, they knew every thought that you've ever had. They knew every feeling that you've ever felt. They know every word you've ever said. And they know every deed that you have ever done. I mean, down to the minutest detail. How would that make you feel? It would absolutely intimidate me. And I would be very worried, especially nowadays with social media. I would be so scared that they're going to put everything out there for the whole world to hear and see, and it'll be the bad stuff. There's just something in all of us that is intimidated with the idea that people might really know us. We don't want to be known, and yet, in a strange way, we all do want to be known. It's just that we we want to be known transparently in a way where people will bless us and love us and give us space and forgive us, but we fear that if people really did know everything about us, that they might reject us, that they may not approve of us, and we desperately want to be approved. We desperately want to be loved. So what we end up being are actors. What I mean by that is we all have people and situations where we want to be accepted, where we want to be loved. And so we do our best to behave and modify our behavior so that that group or that person will love us and accept us. And then we hope they can't see through the cracks, that they can't see our faults and end up rejecting us. Well, I've got a question for you. Is there anybody in your life who knows everything about you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, who will also look at you and think about you at the same time as being perfect and love you perfectly. I think we're all aware that that kind of person doesn't exist, but he does exist. And that's what we're celebrating this resurrection weekend. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the son of God. We think of him as king and we think of him as ruler and savior. But this weekend, I want to challenge you to think of him in a different way. I want you to think of him as your shepherd. And that's a unique way to think about who Jesus is in your life and my life. Now, we've already heard the story of the resurrection, greatest story ever told. But I also want to tell you about something else that Jesus said. It's found in John chapter 10. 
and I'm going to read it for you. And it goes like this. In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrificed my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too. They are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about him. Some said, ah, he's demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? And others said, this doesn't sound like a man who's possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? It was now winter and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I get them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he's more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. The father and I, we are one. What did Jesus mean when he said he wants to be your shepherd and my shepherd? What was he trying to intimate to us about the relationship that he wants with us? You know, if you know something about shepherds, you can conclude that in essence, what Jesus is saying is, I want to completely care for you like a shepherd must completely, a good shepherd must completely care for the sheep. Imagine that there's someone who wants to care for your soul completely. In fact, Jesus has proven that. How did he prove that? We talked about it on Good Friday. He proved it by going to the cross and dying your death for you and for me. So that as we say, we can live his life, be loved and accepted by his father. See, he's the one who you're looking for, who I'm looking for, who can know everything about us and still love us. The problem is we have a tendency to look in all the wrong places for that one. You know, we look to our spouse if we're married or we look to our parents, we look to our kids or we look to our peers or to our friends or our coworkers. Sometimes we even, you know, look to the pastor or we, we look to a politician or we look to a celebrity or we look to a certain group, but we are all searching who's going to love me and accept me for who I am. Who's going to care deeply for me? Who can know everything about me and not reject me? But you know something? It's a proven fact. It's a proven fact that there is nobody outside of Jesus Christ who will know everything about you and never disappoint you. What I mean by that is even the people that you know love you, spouse, kids, parents, friends, there are times when when their response to you is very disappointing. And do you know why? why? Oftentimes it's because we've been disappointing to them. They've seen through the cracks. They really see who we are and what we're like. And so they do things like yell at us or ignore us or give us the silent treatment or they swear at us or they tell us to get out or they reject us. They walk away from us. Shall I continue? You know what I'm talking about, right? It's happened to all of us. We've all been disappointed by how somebody has decided to respond or treat us. And all of us have done that to somebody, but not Jesus. Jesus knows everything about you and me, and he chooses to love us. I like what Tim Keller says. He says, until you recognize your need for the one true shepherd, you are always going to be restless and you're always going to be unhappy. That's because 
people aren't going to give you the response that Jesus is willing to give you and willing to give me. I guess what I'm trying to say to you, and I'm reminding myself of this as well, is that as Jesus expressed in John chapter 10, verse 10 and 14, he, he wants to be your good shepherd. And he says he wants to fulfill and satisfy your life. Can you imagine that? Don't you want this resurrection weekend to be absolutely fulfilled and absolutely satisfied? That's what Jesus wants to do for you. And that's what he wants to do for me. But the problem is, will we believe that? We, we, will we really believe that he's risen, that he's really wanting to be our shepherd, that he's really wanting to love us? Because sometimes we are challenged to even love ourselves because, hey, nobody knows us better than we know ourselves, right? And sometimes we have a hard time believing that God, a holy, righteous God would love us that way, but he does. You know, they were arguing in Jesus' day, some that he was possessed, others that, well, he can't be possessed. He's at least a good man. He's perhaps a prophet. How about you, this resurrection weekend? Do you honestly believe that he is the son of God and that he does love you and that he does want to be your shepherd? You say, how can I know that he wants to be my shepherd? I mean, why would he want to be my shepherd? And I want to remind you of this very important point. And that is that you can trust Jesus today. You can trust him completely because he has completely given his life away for you. In other words, he's proven it. Not just by who he claimed to be, but what he did and then by his resurrection You know, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He gave himself for the worst of us and the worst in us because he loves us so much. And then he proved that what he did was sufficient because he rose again on the third day. You know, in John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, And I read these words to you. Jesus said, the father loves me because I sacrificed my life for you and for me. So I may take it back again. He says, no one can take my life from me. Did you hear that? No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is my, what my father has commanded. Do you hear what Jesus is saying there? He's saying, listen, death did not come for me. I came for death. That's what he did. I came to conquer death is what Jesus is saying. And then he's telling us that he has eliminated the ultimate threat of death, which is eternal separation from God. You know, I don't care how a rational culture wants to put this how a material culture wants to say it, but death is not natural. You hear it all the time. Oh, death is just a natural part of life. It's not. I mean, if it was, then why do we fight it so much? Why are we afraid of it? Why do we try to avoid it so much? It's because deep down inside, something in us says, that's just not natural. And yet all of us, the Bible says, die. And death has this way of pulling us apart. It separates the soul from the body. Death in itself, it it decomposes. It pulls our whole body apart. But all of that is a physical symbol of something far more dangerous, far more sad than physical death. And that is the tearing apart that sin has caused, the tearing apart of our lives from God and that eternal separation from him. And here's what's beautiful. You see, Jesus stepped between death and his father, between us and death. And you know what he did? He tore himself apart. He tore himself apart from the father. Or if you want to put it this way, Jesus stepped between you and death and tore himself apart from his father so you wouldn't have to be torn apart from God. Isn't that amazing? Yes, we still die physically, but guess what? That's in preparation to receive a brand new resurrection body. 
be absent from the body for the believers to be present with God. Jesus has made it possible that at the moment of death, when we close our eyes, we immediately are in paradise. We are with the Lord. We are in his presence. I like what it says in Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. The writer says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. I love that. You and I have been set free. Jesus tore himself apart, tore himself apart from the father. Remember when he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would rather be forsaken by his father than have you and I forsaken for eternity. That's what he did for you and for me. Do you know that? Are you celebrating that this resurrection weekend? All he's done. And listen, he knows everything about you. He does. He knows everything about you and me, past, present, future. And he still loves us. And he still sees us as perfect. There's an interesting contrast in the scriptures. This contrast occurs in the book of Revelation and another book of prophecy that has prophecy in it, the book of Isaiah. In Revelation chapter 16, there's a passage there that says when God finally brings this world to an end and his, his wrath, his judgment comes down in this world, there are going to be those who still hate God and who in essence are going to say, God, You know, I hate you. And I just wish right now that the rocks would cover me up. They're going to want to hide from God. They're going to be buried from God. They want to be covered up from God because they're so filled with guilt and so filled with shame. You ever notice your, your kids when they were little, when they did something wrong, what did they want to do? They went and they would hide from you. Right. And of course we, as adults, we are more sophisticated about that. You know, we try to hide when we do wrong things as well. But, you know, Jesus has made it possible for us not to have to hide from God anymore. You know, there's that very strange passage of scripture where we read in Genesis that the man and the woman, when God first created them, were naked and not ashamed. I love that passage of scripture because it means they were not self-conscious. They weren't feeling guilty. They weren't feeling shame. But as soon as they sinned, what did they do? They wanted to cover up. Listen. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 tells us that God has covered us up with his grace. Let me read that passage to you. The writer says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord, my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I'm like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. Hey, listen, you never look better than you do at your wedding. You may never get a second look in your life, but at your wedding, the man, the husband, the groom is the most handsome man in the crowd. And the bride, oh my goodness, she's the most beautiful woman in the crowd. Do you know why? Because they've been dressed up. Now, in all honesty, most of the guys that I know can get ready for the wedding in about five minutes. Most women take at least five hours. Why is that? Because first of all, somebody has to do their hair or several people do their hair. Then somebody does their makeup. Then somebody lays out the dress and somebody helps them get dressed. And someone makes all the adjustments and during the entire ceremony, somebody's kind of handling the dress for them and making sure everything's in its right place. They make them look beautiful. What Jesus is saying to you and me is that he has made us, he has dressed us in his glory. He has dressed us in his righteousness and he makes us beautiful to his father. So his father can look at you and me. And despite everything we've ever said, thought, felt, or done, he can only see the perfection of what his son has done for us. Do you know that shepherd? Do you know that gift? Do you know that perfection? This Resurrection Weekend, we want to share a story with you. Lizzie is going to talk to you about how she was searching for that shepherd in her life, how she tried so many different things to find satisfaction and overcome anxiety. 
but how when she met Jesus, it changed her life. Would you listen to Lizzie's story? Today, out of sheer boredom, I looked through some boxes in the closet. I found this old book. There was a cartoon in it, and it showed a story between a good boy and a bad boy. The good boy had an angel sitting over his head. He got up when his parents called and made his bed without complaining. He even went to church with his family, smiling the whole time. The bad boy had a picture of the devil over his head. He always wanted to sleep in and never made his bed. The bad boy did not want to go to church, which got me thinking. I like to sleep in. I don't make my bed. I never go to church. When I do go to church, Mama makes me wear nice clothes, and I hate nice clothes. Am I bad? We're headed to a concert, and I need to decide. Hammerfall shirt or the corset? I'd rather just wear jeans, but George and I are going together, so I need to look good. All right, corset it is. Afterwards, a group of us are going to a party. I've been thinking about it literally all day. I know, Lizzie, I know, I know. Stop it. Once I get there, have a couple shots, it'll be good. Last night was awesome. Actually, maybe not all awesome. Towards the end of the night, I needed to help a friend avoid a creeper. Creeper guy kept insisting she come with him, and she's always willing to put herself into harm's way. Not a good pairing. I guess overall, lots of fun, but I feel sort of disgusted. I've been painting again. Tonight, I finished a piece I named My Trash-Filled River. I think painting helps me stay focused and pretty calm. I love the art I have been doing lately. It's different from before. It's dark, uh, but still abstract. I feel like it helps me sort through the noise in my head. Lately, when I sit down to paint, I get confused and uh, fidgety. Like tonight, I wanted to paint, but my hands just wouldn't start. It's like my brain just paused. I sat and stared at the white canvas. I didn't see a vision. In fact, I saw nothing. It's been four days since I've left the house. I can't sleep. George has given me various suggestions in an attempt to help calm my mind. Recently, he's been turning on different shows for me. The Twilight Zone probably wasn't the best option. I don't wake him because, well, I don't want him to worry. I met a new therapist today. He gave me some ideas on how to focus and work through my anxiety. I'm supposed to journal. <laughs> it almost seems like a joke. I'm supposed to ask what my anxiety wants when it makes me unable to breathe. I feel like I'm bribing an angry child to just leave me be. You are not going to believe what happened today. I texted my brother and asked where he goes to church. He told me about Wooddale in Eden Prairie. I feel so strange and awkward. Honestly, I am embarrassed. I just watched a Christian sermon. Not only did I watch it, but I think it just calmed me down, like, a lot. I had to share this with George. He's such a good man. He knows my struggles with anxiety and panic. He's been my rock since I was 19. I love him. So I told him, George, I have to tell you something. He said, okay, what is it? I said, I just listened to a sermon. I knew he wasn't going to be mean or rude, but I never ever thought those words 
would leave my mouth. What came out of his mouth next changed my life. He asked, did it help? Yes, George, it helped. I was so far away from God, but while the things I was doing to try to heal weren't working, God was transforming in me. I realized I could not change myself. Like you saw, I was drinking to hide from the anxiety. I was occupying my mind with hobbies to keep me busy. Sometimes these things worked, but I was still stuck in the confusion. But here I find myself changed just by reading his living word. I am freed from the noise in my head and I have peace of mind and clarity because of God. In 2019, I started listening to sermons and reading the Bible. And the more I read the Bible, the more I knew I could follow Jesus. So on Easter of 2020, I said yes to Jesus and started working through some of the questions I had about God and about the Bible with some amazing people. My one-on-one -on -one mentor continues to bless me as we work through what it is to know God and what it means to be part of His body. I no longer live for myself. I live for God. My faith evolves as the days go on. I know He stays the same, but how I see Him does not. It was a wonderful counselor I needed, just not the one the world could provide. If you had a chance to really sit and soak up what Lizzie was saying, then I want to ask you a question. Do you have the same joy and the same peace that she has found? If you do, then this is just such an awesome weekend, isn't it? To celebrate all that God has done for you. But if you're not sure, or you know that you have not really taken Jesus as your shepherd, I would love to invite you this weekend to make the most important decision of your life, to surrender yourself as a sheep to the great shepherd who gave his life and proved that he gave his life by resurrecting from the dead. I want to challenge you to totally surrender yourself to him right now, and you can do that. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's not the words that matter so much, but it's your heart. So right where you are right now at one of our campuses or our venues, or if you happen to be watching us online from someplace around the world, right where you are right now, would you just bow your head? Would you say, Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I am in search of a shepherd, and I've tried so many different people and methods and ways, and I still have no peace. I admit to you I'm a sinner. I admit to you my shortcomings. God, forgive my sins. Lord Jesus, become my shepherd and my savior. Thank you for loving me the way I am. And thank you for being willing to come into my life and change me and make me more like you. Today, I surrender everything to you. Lord Jesus, for whomever has prayed that prayer, I know, Lord, you're looking at their heart. And what matters is the sincerity of our hearts that we truly have said yes to Jesus. Lord, may you give them a peace that now passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you're at one of our campuses or venues, your host is going to tell you what to do next because we want to help you get moving in this new and exciting journey with the Lord. Perhaps you have already received Christ, but you're recommitting your life to Christ. Well, then let us walk with you in that recommitment. Or perhaps you've, you know, recommitted your life, you're walking well with God, then we want to celebrate with you what God has done. So listen to what your host or campus pastor has to share with you. For those of you who have joined us online, we would love to know if you said yes to Jesus this weekend. And all you have to do is click on that link that you'll see there in the side where it has chat. 
Or if you're watching this later on, the link isn't live there, just follow the link or go to our website and let us know that you made a commitment to Jesus Christ because I want to send you something that's going to help you get moving on your journey. And though you may be thousands of miles away from where we are, if you let us know, we'll get you connected one way or the other in a virtual group in some means, some way. We'll make sure you're not walking this journey alone. I want to wish all of you, I want to pray for all of you to have a great Resurrection Sunday. And may you live out of that joy in the days to come.
So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for hearts singing hallelujah, One of the many ways that we worship God is by responding to the invitation that he has given to us. So uh, thanks for taking those few minutes to respond by declaring this Easter where you're at in response to that invitation that Jesus has given to us all. And if you haven't yet taken a moment to respond, uh, we do want to invite you to do so right now. That's right. You can find the link to the connection card either in the chat. The host should have put that up. Otherwise, there's a URL at the bottom of the screen. Just go ahead and type that in. Fill out the card and let us know. Let us know where you're at today. And we look forward to following up with you. And if you're somebody who said yes to Jesus today for the first time, I'm looking forward to giving you a call this week and talking with you about that and helping you figure out how you can get plugged into a discipleship relationship and get started on this amazing new journey. Yeah, it, it literally is the best yes that you will have ever given. It is a yes that changes and transforms lives. And Lynn, it's a yes that I know you and I both personally have made and are so grateful because that yes just changed everything. So well done in terms of having the courage to take that step and to let us know. And for many of you, maybe your first yes was actually being here for the first time, or maybe you've been new to Wooddale at some point over the last several months or the last year, and you're just looking how you can get connected to our community. So if you live near our Eden Prairie campus, we want to invite you to join us next weekend in person because Lynn and I are going to host a new guest reception, and we'd love for you to be part of it. That's right. We would love to have you come and hang out, learn more about Wooddale and, and how you can get connected, but we also want to learn more about you. And so if you want to join us, you can sign up. There's a URL at the bottom of your screen. Sign up. Let us know you're coming. We'll have lunch for you. You'll get an opportunity to meet some of the other folks that are new to Wooddale. That's right. Hey, thanks for being with us. Happy Easter. And we look forward to seeing you next weekend.